Hello, today I'm going to show you the Fremencio workup on a patient with prior balloon expandable TAVR and now is being evaluated for redo TAVR. This is a bit of a unique situation because we now, although it's rare for us to see patients with failed transcapital heart valve, it's actually now becoming uh, increasingly common. So we're going to show you how we can do that. So first, we're going to click on the automatic segmentation. The first step is to evaluate whether which CT phase gives you the highest resolution of the transcaptor valve. The reason being there can be booming artifacts or motion artifacts make it more difficult to assess coronary obstruction risk, as well as sizing and positioning of the second transcaptor valve. The other thing we would ask for is the pre taver CT to see if the initial anatomy was correctly sized with the first transcaptor valve and whether there are any anatomical complexities that might lead to the current condition, such as calcium at the annulus or LVOT uh, risking paravalvular leak, or there might be a bicuspid valve, uh, making potentially the valve being uh, eccentric, uh, elliptical rather than circular, and also other factors such as dilated LVOT or calcified sinus tubular junction or low coronary height uh, or bulky calcified leaflet. So it's very helpful to review the pre tavr CT on Fremencio to look at some of the reference points such as left vein height, sinus height, to actually also be able to gauge the implant depth of the first transcaptor valve. Now, ideally you want to be able to use the intraprocedural TAVR fluoroscopy and angiography, aortic root angiogram, for example, to look at the final implant depth at the time of the procedure so you can kind of estimate the implant depth of on the CT. But that might not be readily available. But if you have a pre-TAVR CT, there's certain relationships that are constants, such as uh, the left main height or the right coronary height or the sinus height, that will allow you to estimate where the annular plane might have been uh, in this particular CT scan. The other the issue with doing a redo tab or CT workup, like in this case, is that we know that transcaptor valve, when they are deployed, are not always parallel to the annular plane. Sometimes they are pivoted in a different direction. Sometimes they're canted. Uh, sometimes they are deeper on one side and higher on the other. So we typically, what we looked at with the transcaptor valve for redo TAVR evaluation is similar to what we do with TAVR in surgical valves. So surgical valves also can be canted in one way or the other, sometimes towards the left main, sometimes away, sometimes they are exactly parallel. So we try to do the same thing into the same kind of workout, focusing on the center line of the transcaptor valve in terms of evaluating feasibility and the feasibility mostly related to the risk of coronary obstruction and sinus sequestration. So with that in mind, we're gonna do this now, first by either doing a centerline determination of the transcaptor valve. Now this is a 23 millimeter Edward Sapien three valve. So one of the things we will look for is whether this valve is already fully expanded. So first I'm gonna eliminate a lot of these dots above the valve because that's not important for us. And we try to center line around the transcaptor valve here. <clears throat> and you can see that what we like to do is to be able to get on the lower left panel, all the frames aligned such a way that it is coaxial. And you can see that in, I also use the right upper panel to try to get that as much as possible. Sometimes may not be so because remember sometimes the uh, sapien free frame can be asymmetrically expanded. So just keep that in mind, but you try to do it as much as possible. So you can see that now with the inflow. So I'm gonna to try to get the inflow as per perpendicular as possible. And I drop the gain as well to avoid a booming artifact. So with this, I typically will see what the sinuses are. And I try to do the same kind of workout by bisecting the sinus. 
And then I go down here to make a dot at the base of the sapien free frame. I do the same thing around 120 degrees apart from each other. And then with the non sinus, and then now I have roughly the inflow mapped out. So now I'm going to try to carefully identify the first crown where the inflow is, and then that will be kind of my quote unquote neo annular plane. This is not the native aortic valve annulus. This is rather the inflow of the sapien free valve that you're going to use for your measurements in the dimension. So that looks pretty good. So I'm going to now go in terms of perpendicular manner to try to make sure you can see there's some artifact here to get the frame as symmetric as possible. Sometimes it's not feasible and you're going to have to accept it, but this looks pretty good. So once you have satisfied with this kind of centerline determination, you click confirm. So now you have the inflow of your sapien free valve. And I'm going to do the same thing with doing a lasso too and trace out the frame dimension. Now, rather than going outer part of the frame or inner, I actually cut across in the center because this has got the average of the booming artifact. If you do the inner, you're going to be more towards the inner uh, internal diameter of the valve, which I guess is valid in terms of your sizing. Certainly, if you do it outer, then you'll be overestimating the dimensions of the transcatheter valve. But in the center, you pretty much be able to get a rough estimate of the average so that you can account for potential further expansion of the balloon expandable valve, which in this case, you can see the inflow dimension is almost 22 millimeters. So it's not exactly 23, so it's slightly under expanded. So there can be potential opportunity to expand this valve further. For example, if the failure mechanism is paraviral leak and you might be able to expand it to reduce it. But if it's transcaptor valve failure, what we typically would do is to also expand this more nominal in size to make as much room as possible internally for the internal diameter such that the second transcaptor valve, whatever that might be, the implant will have the optimal hemodynamics and expansion. So I'm going to save this as called 23S3 inflow, so we know what it is. And then I'm going to also, similar to what you've seen in my prior other workout videos, to crop this and zoom this in. And I'm going to do the left main view, and you can see that here. So I'm going to next go to the outflow. So I'm going to go all the way up to where the valve disappear. Now the nominal expansion of a 23 sapien free is 18 millimeters. So you can see that here, at least on CT, the valve, as you can see some artifact, it's a bit more elongated, right? Than 18 millimeters. In fact, it's like 18.5 here. It's actually going a little bit even higher there. I'll show you, for example, here on the top right view, if I drop the gain so that you see actually the frame a little better, you can actually see the frame is actually asymmetrically expanded. Part of the frame is actually a little taller than the side facing the left main. So that's why this is kind of an estimate, not a true height of the transcaptor valve because it depends on which side you measure. So I'm going to put it here, it's actually 19.6. I'm going to measure from the, that's kind of where the height of the valve is. And of course you can see that here, that's the left main. Now this is not the left main height. Don't just click left corner height. You have to go actually custom length and go down to where the annulus appears and the sinuses disappear. So you can see that here. See the sinuses here and come down. So roughly it's here. Again, we don't have a prior CT of this patient, unfortunately. So this is kind of what we estimate to be the left corny height. But that would be helpful had we had that information of the baseline CT. So this is kind of our uh, actual native analysts 
roughly what it is. And you can see that here, if you look at the custom measurement, the implant depth is roughly six millimeters. So this is more like a, if you look at 18 millimeter, or in this case, 19.6 millimeter as the frame height of the 23 S3, six millimeters. So it's almost like two thirds and a third. So like set almost 70, 30 uh, deployment. So certainly not a high deployment. So going back to the top of the frame now, I'm going to try to measure this outflow and click on the lasso two, and then I trace it all around. And I want to make sure that these two lines are more perpendicular than what shows right now, because obviously that will impact on your measurement. So this is the outflow. Outflow, you can see almost 21 millimeters, so it's certainly a big constraint and under expanded. And then what I do is I can save that as well. So it'll be 23 S3 outflow. And then I look at the mid frame because sometimes there's a waste in the middle. Uh, even if a balloon expanded out, it might not be truly circular. So with 19.5, I'm gonna take it down in half. So around maybe 9.7 or so. So this is kind of the mid segment, I call it the mid frame. And this part of the, Wow, it's also useful to look at the commissure orientation. So you can see that here now, this is 20 millimeters. So you can see actual in reality, the mid part of the frame is grossly underexpanded compared to a 23 nominal S3, it's only in 20 millimeters. So could that be a reason why the valve failed? We don't know, but that is a, certainly a possibility. So I'm going to put mid frame here so that people will know what that is. So now I'm going to look at the valve orientation. Now, sometimes with the motion artifact, it's hard to delineate this. And you can see this valve, it's actually hard to see what the commissure posts are. There are some indications of perhaps this is the commissure orientation because these are a little thicker. And you remember the double lines mounting on the commissure. So you see, might see sometimes the frames is thicker in those area. If you need to, often one of the tricks is to actually use a diastolic phase, a 75% phase, because with diastole, the valve levers should be closed. You can get a better uh, orientation assessment. So unfortunately, this one, the diastolic phase was actually quite a lot of artifacts, so we end up using a systolic phase. So if you have an idea of the commercial orientation. And let's just for the sake of assumption that we have it here. So you can put a marker actually on the commercial pulse. Marker one, right click measurements, go marker, marker two. And obviously they should be 120 degrees apart being a transcaptor valve and marker three. So now you actually have the commercial pulse of the sapien three in place and you can see how it actually nicely stays in place, you can track the orientation. So what I would do typically is to go measurements, go an angle tool, and then I go cut across the left main, and I go to the right to determine the inter corner angle. Why is that important? Well, I wanna see where the commissures are relative to the corner, and you can see that that's the right corner, so I need to adjust this tier. And then when I go back to the mid frame portion where the commissures can be seen, then I can know now in this particular case, the commissure alignment is actually good with the native aortic anatomy. You can see that the left main is here, the right corner is here. So in terms of redo tavern, if you have run the risk of sinus sequestration and coronal obstruction, a leaflet management technique like you know basilica, or maybe even some of the new devices like shortcut may be useful because now you can potentially do the same thing that you were done with the uh, surgical valve uh, in the case of Taber in Sauber. So I like to save a picture of this as well, just to see what the commissures are. So 23 S3 commissures to left main uh, CA. Okay. So now let's take a look at the root anatomy. The other thing that we'd like to look at is perhaps the STJ. So you can certainly match the STJ here.
and you can also let me just delete this to so you can be an STJ. And also you can actually think about measuring the sinuses as well. Again, remember this is kind of where the virtual analyst is. So if you want to measure the sinus height, you go here and you custom length, and you actually have to go back to where you measure your STJ and that would be your actual sinus height, okay? So with that, you would uh, cut the sinus in half, but of course there's not much sinus here, so it's actually quite difficult to measure where the sinuses are, but you would, sometimes if it's generous enough, you may be able to figure it out. So now because of the good commercial alignment, you can literally use those as kind of references to help you terminal sinuses, it's a very small sinus valsalva in this particular patient. And of course, you can also make a snapshot on here and save that. Now, what we really want to look at is, do we have coronary clearance for a reduced power? And this is where the valve to coronary distance matters, right, that we talked about before. Now, thankfully, the top of the valve here actually sits below just below the left main. You can see that here, the left main coming up here. Now, so what would you would typically have done is to measure the distance here, measure distance going from the frame to the coronary. So this is the kind of a, almost like a valve to coronary distance. And you can here, you can also do the same measurement, 3.7 or so millimeters. And of course, with the right corner, you can do the same thing. This is the right corner. Remember, we did do that earlier. So that's, and you can see, this is the right corner taking off. So that's kind of the VTC. You of course can save a screenshot of that. So VTC, left main. If it's if the frame sits above the corner, then you need to measure here the VTSTJ, right? Because you can imagine uh, that this distance, if it's sufficient, then it doesn't matter where the left main is, it could be as low as that. You should be able to have sufficient corner flow. However, if there's distance here, the, if the frame sits high and your VTSTJ is small, that could, could be a problem. This is similar to what uh, Danny DeVere and I proposed a vivid classification for tower and surgical standard valve uh, in terms of the root classification in terms of anatomy. For balloon expandable valve, in terms of the workup, it's actually not dissimilar. So after we save that, really the next step to look at is also, we'll just uh, look at the right corner, which I already outlined here. You can see where it is. Again, this is not the right coronary height. You have to go all the way down. Remember that our estimated implant depth. Being six minutes. So that's kind of more like what we would expect for our right coronary height. And we don't have a previous CT to compare, but and that will be your sinotubular junction height, sinus height. Oops, sorry. So that would require custom length measurement and go down there. So that will be more consistent with the sinus height. So what you do is you now save this saturated view. It's very confusing. I know there are a lot of numbers here, but this is the frame height of the 23S3. This is kind of the sinus height. 
think I might have to shrink this a little bit to show. This is the valve to coronary distance. This is the le proposed left main height, and this is the implant depth. So a lot of numbers here, but these numbers are kind of helpful in terms of positioning. Ultimately, you want to look through an aerogram of the valve to actually help visualize that. I think that's probably the most definitive way. And it's now right click to look at the right coronary height. So, but that's the kind of what I would do here. So now let's look at the valve frame itself. So unfortunately you can see that's a bit of artifact here of this particular uh, device. So it's harder to tell you what to, how to measure, but you can also measure the frame height by dropping the gain here. And then you can actually see how one side of the valve is taller than the other. You can actually measure the height here. This is kind of a free cusp view. You can see that here. Of course, on fluoroscopy, you'll be able to see that very well. So I just measured the kind of average, not all the way to the outer frame, but the, the inflow and then the height of that side. So you can see how it compares. So with motion artifact, for example, the scan being this kind of quality is not ideal. And you need to use floral to really assess the coronary obstruction risk. We've been pleasantly surprised. So some patients on CT look like, oh, it's pretty ominous about risk of sinus secretion and coronary obstruction. But actually when we did the aortogram, I would do, encourage you to do an LAO cranial view, take the parallax out of the transcaptor valve and then do a semi-selective aortogram to see the left main clearance. Then surprisingly, sometimes actually uh, there's plenty of clearance. There's no issue with coronary obstruction at all. So a redo tower would definitely not be a problem. So definitely do that. Uh, I think that's more important than actually doing this measurements here. So here's some of the measurements here. I'll just uh, save that. And then of course you can also rotate this to look at, let me just delete these measurements here. You can also actually rotate this to a hockey puck view. And you can see that this valve is not exactly circular. So you can do that as well. So let's take a look at the report and see what we have created. It's, uh, I know it's more, uh, more complex than just a native tower workup. So you can see I have the inflow. I'm gonna move this here, mid frame. I think this is very important to see whether you need to pre dilate dilate this before putting a second valve in. I would probably do that with, to try to expand this further, maybe do a, a pre-dilatation of a 23 true balloon to expand this as normally as possible before putting the second transcatheter valve. Because once you put a second transcatheter valve in, it's much harder, uh, almost impossible, I would say, to expand the initial frame even further. This is the commissure orientation uh, layout that I think is important in terms of the risk of coronary obstruction and sinus sequestration, any leaflet management strategy necessary, and also from the perspective of coronary access after redo tower. I have the sinotubular junction and sinus salva here. I'm gonna move this a little bit just in terms of layout. You can see the left main and the right coronary kind of uh, layout. You can see the valve to coronary distances, the frame, and then the hockey puck. So this is kind of summarizing how you might work up a redo tower with the balloon expandable valve. In this particular case, there's no issue with coronary obstruction and sinus sequestration. So you can use a balloon expandable valve again or self-expanding valve, which will probably give you a better hemodynamics because it's super annular. And I would aim for commercial alignment with the self-expanding valve so that you avoid uh, issue with future coronary access because now you have a taller commercial post facing the coronary if you have misaligned. And so you can save this PDF and share with your heart team. And of course you can save the session as well to your own need. So I hope this is helpful to you in terms of the redo tab of up with a balloon expandable valve in place. Uh, this is certainly more complex uh, than a valve in surgical valve workup or even native tab workup. I hope this is helpful to you and we'll see you next time.